and hello, welcome. My name is Mara. I am the workshops coordinator for Green Thumb. We are the part of the parks department that works with community gardens citywide. We are so grateful for everyone who's joining us today um, from across the city, it seems, during this really tumultuous and uncertain time. Um, Green Thumb is so grateful for everything you guys are doing to keep our community gardens safe and healthy. We hope you and your loved ones are safe as well. Um, and we are so excited to be able to support you as best as we can from afar in all of your food production endeavors this season. So throughout this webinar, we are going to keep everyone muted as much as possible um, and use the chat feature to communicate with one another and for questions and comments. That way we can hear our facilitators uninterrupted. So if you haven't yet made your way over to the chat box, you can find it by hovering over your screen or tapping on your screen. You'll see a bunch of icons come up, one of which it looks like a little speech bubble. And that's where we will be for, um, add all of your questions there and I will read them out loud to our facilitators during the Q&A component. You can choose whether or not your camera is on, um, you can choose whether or not we will see you and that way um, it's, it's up to you if you want if you want to be seen or not but I'm going to have the video pinned on um, either myself or one of our two facilitators who are um, Onika Abraham from Farm School NYC. We're so grateful that you are able to join us today. And Joseph Heller from the USDA NRCS. We are also really grateful that you are able to join us today. And so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And I am going to pass the mic over to Onika. Thank you, Mara. Thank you everyone for coming today. I see we have 25 on the line. Um, apologies in, in advance, I'm more of a Zoom person, uh, but I'm going to get a hang, the hang of the web um, In When we're in real life, I love to understand who's in our audience and get a little bit more information about folks and what they want to hear. Um, so on this life, uh, we will do that by using the chat box. Um, please let us know, one, I'm very, very curious if you're already growing using um, what I say growing undercover. Um, and so that's growing using some kind of additional um, cover, whether that's under glass or under plastic. We'll talk a little bit more about what elements um, you can use um, right now. Uh, that's the first part of our agenda. Um, we'll share some knowledge about the types of different um, structures that you can grow under. Um, and then we'll talk about the benefits um, and some of the challenges of doing that. Then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Joe from NRCS, who's going to talk about some of the resources that we are available to us as urban garden gardeners here in New York um, City, based on a program that NRCS is sponsoring, which will provide some funds to allow us to actually um, invest and install some of the structures. So those are the two parts of what we're going to do today. And I'm going to start by just, um, I'm going to share my screen in just a minute and start by talking about what are some of these different structures uh, that we're talking about when we talk about season extensions, um, items, or things of that nature? So here it goes. Uh, let's see, use my screen, open up. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see my slides. Um, I can no longer see y'all, so you'll just have to let me know if, if there's something I miss. Um, but the first slide here is about. Nico, we can't see your slides yet. Um, Let's see. So there's the share content little icon. Okay, let's end show. And it's this one screen. What about now? Yes, now we can see. All right, cool. Um, so the first slide is really looking at some of the different items that are available to us. Um, really curious in the poll to see, I saw there a couple of people had started to answer that they're growing more in an open garden at this point. Um, there are a number of different structures that we talk about when we talk about um, high and low tunnels, but maybe the most basic item that has been used for real, a really, really long time are what we sometimes refer to as cloches. 
Um, and these are, um, you'll see at the top on the left, um, there are, I cannot imagine gardening like this, but you'll see that there are what seems, I think in this particular field, there's actually 250,000 um, glass bells um, in this field. And under each of these bells is, I believe that they were planting lettuce at the time, workers planting lettuce. This picture dates back to Great Britain in the 18, mid 1800s. Um, and this, and the picture on the right hand side is also using glass bells. This is a, a kind of a, an older system of doing this. People still use glass bells today. Um, there are other ways that we can um, kind of recreate this. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons why we might not want to use glass bells um, in today, especially in urban areas. Um, one being, I mean, they're really heavy. Um, another being, if they break, then you've got a bed full of glass, which is not ideal by any stretch. And if your garden is anything like my yard was when I first started, uh, it was already full of glass. So the last thing I want to do is risk having more. Um, so you'll see some modern um, versions of this with water bottles and soda bottles, which are actually cut off at the bottom and sat over plants that could use some additional protections. Um, so these are some initial um, ideas of growing under glass. And the next slide here, we have some other options and we're going to talk about what the benefits and why you would want to do this in just a, in a few minutes. Um, but at, at farm school in our, uh, we have two courses that kind of talk about um, growing under different elements. And this is uh, our season extension course, uh, which some of these pictures were taken from. And what you see here is an example of low tunnels. Um, so I think that the name is pretty evocative of what they are. Um, you'll see on the, um, on the right hand side here, the beginnings of a low tunnel construction. There are hoops that are going over the bed and it's actually attached to a bed itself. This is one way of doing this. Uh, where you um, are creating, sometimes you can actually move the, uh, the, the hoops out um, and off of the bed when you want to, um, but it's called a low tunnel because it's obviously low to the ground. Um, it's high enough to allow you to plant um, plants of a certain height, so I think that this particular one on the right would probably, uh, it looks like it's about um, maybe three feet off of the ground um, at the um, pinnacle of the arch. Um, but remember, there's no soil in it yet. So once there's soil in it, it'll probably be more like about a two foot clearing in the middle of the of the um, bed. Um, and you can cover this with a number of different things. So um, here it's still under construction, so it's not covered with anything, but you have options. So you'll see over on the left, um, you'll, there's the a hoop and this one, um, it looks like it's directly into the ground. Um, and they're just hoops that are attached on a frame um, and then covered here with shade cloth. Um, so that's a, an option that you can do. Um, and then there's another kind of lower, a low tunnel type um, structure on the left, to the, to the uh, lower left, and that is um, called a cold frame. Um, the cold frame, one of the differentiations between cold frames and uh, what I would call more of a low tunnel um, is the slope on it. Um, and the slope is really um, effective in being able to capture more sunlight kind of coming into the structure. So you would angle that, um, that sloped part, uh, hopefully on a southern exposure or somewhere where you would get additional sun. Um, and that just uh, lowers the amount of shade that you'll get into that structure and maximizes the amount of, of sunlight and thus heat. Um, and so this is this structure right now. Um, that's actually one of our instructors, Marissa from Earth Matter, is um, is hosting this particular class. And I believe that they're probably at Earth Matter at the time. Um, but this this is a, a great thing that you can um, use and um, at some sometimes move around your garden based on what you need. Um, so those are some of the lower structures. And then the next picture here is really talking about high tunnels, um, structures that are um, big enough for us to walk in, stand up in, grow in much larger plants. Um, high tunnels are a more of a, a, a modern idea and in, in some sense. Um, high tunnels are called high tunnels, tunnels because they are higher than low tunnels. They're also higher than the typical greenhouse. 
Um, there's an example of what we would probably designate more of a greenhouse on the far left of this, um, the structure that has that wood framing um, on the far left. That was taken at La Finca, I believe, when they um, when this structure was initially built. Uh, but that is more of a greenhouse structure, and I'll talk a little bit about the differences amongst those. So um, a greenhouse is typically um, made a, a permanent structure. So you'll see that this one is, is framed, and it looks like um, it's probably a, a bit more difficult to move in a lot of ways. Um, the structure is made of, this one is in particular is made of a, a, a polycarbonate, a, a harder plastic. Um, oftentimes, greenhouses are also made of glass. Um, and typically in a greenhouse, you'll grow on benches. So you'll see here that there's um, mulch on the floor here. Um, they're not digging into the floor of this green of this greenhouse and planting directly in the soil. Um, they'll be growing um, in containers, most likely in flats on these different benches. Um, what you'll see on the uh, in contrast on the far right, you'll see that someone here, this is one of our former um, students, uh, Travis, um, and he's growing, this is in that structure, they're growing directly in the ground. So uh, the picture is a little bit tighter, but you'll see that there is indeed a structure around him. He's inside of a high tunnel um, and there's soil right there that they're working in. Um, similarly, in the middle picture, uh, this is a high tunnel where they're growing in raised beds. Um, so that is a big distinguishing characteristic for a high tunnel. Um, on some larger operations, high tunnels are high, high enough off the ground to allow for um, cultivating equipment to go through, to actually drive a tractor through the high tunnel. Um, and so in the beginnings of kind of using this structure, um, oftentimes it was used on, on a production scale farm with tractors, and that's why they were so high. But for our uses, it's also great to have a high tunnel of that height because it allows you to grow um, bigger vegetables and just kind of move through more easily. Um, so one of the uh, things are why we even want to use these structures. I think the most obvious um, answers are often around light and warmth, in particular warmth. So right now, over to my, uh, my right here in my um, home office, I have tomato plants that would love to get outside. And right now it is way too cold for them. Um, our evening temperature outside is still in the 40s. I think just the other night it was in the 30s. Um, and it's way too cold to have my tomatoes outside. However, if I had a high tunnel or a low tunnel, that, um, that structure would really trap in heat and provide a consistently, more consistent warm temperature for me to be able to, one, warm up the soil earlier in the year so I could have um, really work the soil earlier, um, allow more consistent um, temperature in that structure during the growing season, um, and allow a lot of light in as well to really um, give the plants that boost. The consistency around that is really important in terms of plant of using plants in that space too. Um, so when we have a huge torrential downpour, um, those plants are protected. Um, it also protects the soil within those tunnels at that time too, so that you're not washing away our hard earned um, soil um, where we've been building that structure and um, loosening up um, the soil. We're not compacting it additional rain and that's really important as well lowering that soil erosion. Um, as you're moving into the season, the growing season, it also can really help reduce pest pressure. So if you're um, dealing with particular types of um, plants that might be very prone to um, cucumber beetles, or if you're dealing with a lot of um, you know, tomato hornworms or things of that nature, sometimes you can really isolate um, those plants from that pressure by providing them um, a little bit more uh, structure. Um, also, when you're first seeding certain things um, and the birds and the squirrels and everything else is trying to dig them up, that additional um, ability to kind of um, isolate your plants can be really helpful. Um, and I think one of the most wonderful things about being able to use these structures is that you're really able to lengthen the growing season in a way that allows you to grow more food often more culturally relevant food. So if we're talking about things that love a lot of heat, um, like particular types of hot peppers or okra, 
or even cotton. There's all sorts of things that you can really um, dig into and grow more of if you're using a ton. Of course, there's some downsides to that as well. So if you're trapping in, um, if you're trapping out pests, sometimes you can also trap them in, and that can be a real um, issue when you're dealing with um, growing in high tunnels or any enclosed space. Um, that element of really um, exacerbating um, viruses, so things like, um, and also um, mildew and things like that in tomatoes can often be a problem um, if you're not monitoring it. So oftentimes you really need to be um, on top of what's going on within any kind of structure that you're growing in because things can really spread rapidly if you're not paying attention to them. Um, in, in New York City, when we're growing in our, in our community gardens and other spaces, um, one of the big considerations is how much space you actually have to even um, devote to using these structures. So if you're using a low tunnel, often you can move it around on different beds or even take it off altogether and put it in the corner if you don't want to use it for a certain time. But if you have a high tunnel, you really have to commit to having that space. And um, when Joe, I'm turning it over to Joe in just a minute, um, and he might speak about the fact that there's actual, if you're going to be using some of the funding um, structures, opportunities that, that's, um, that his agency is sponsoring, there are actual size limits that you need to abide by. Um, so you really need to make sure that you have a space available, space on the outer edges of the high tunnel, space where you can actually put it um, in, a, in a sunny area so that you're actually getting the benefits of heating it up with passive solar. So those are all considerations that need to be thought about. Um, high tunnels are, need some maintenance, um, particularly high tunnels, also low tunnels and other things. Um, they're going to need a little bit of maintenance. The, the plastic that you typically would use to cover them um, needs to be replaced. Um, definitely not annually. Um, when you buy, depending on the, the weight that you buy, there'll be a different life expectancy of it. But often you need to kind of, you know, think about investing in that again after about four to five years um, after the UV rays and things start to degrade it. Um, the wind and the snow also can start to degrade it. So you'll need to factor that in when you're um, thinking about installing it in your garden. And lastly, installation and materials costs can be still significant. So depending on the size of your high tunnel, it could cost up to $5,000 uh, for materials. And then you'll also have to think about installing it. Um, oftentimes there are um, people who are within your own um, circles at your gardens that might be able to help with that. But sometimes you're going to need, often you're going to need a little bit of um, extra support and making sure that you're really um, building the structure that will last. Um, and that might be an investment as well. So thinking of all of those things um, that are, are possibilities, um, it's really wonderful to understand and to know that there are resources available to community gardeners to help us invest um, in these structures. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do so. Let's see. Um, and ask Mara, first of all, really hopeful that y'all are using the chat. I'm going to check now about questions that you have about some of these basics around um, what structures to use and how to use them um, and what the challenges are. Um, but let's talk about some of the resources that are available. And I'll pass that off on to Joe. Let me know if you can hear me. We can hear you. Well, my name is Joe Heller, and I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So there may be a few acronyms that we're going to discuss uh, relate to our programs. Um, so I will try to ensure that um, saying the full name of the organization, I'm going to point out a few of these acronyms in the PowerPoint, um, which should be distributed to all of the guests here today as well. Um, my job is I work as a conservationist in the uh, Hudson Valley. I work with Liz to cover New York City. It's so vast, uh, such a large territory that we all partner together to uh, assure assistance within New York City. And um, currently working to establish the um, very exciting in the last farm bill, the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. So that will have to be a discussion for another time, but I did just want to mention there are great things on the horizon for urban growers, farmers, uh, community gardeners, and hydroponics, aquaponics, and those kind of things. 
but with that said, uh, today we're going to discuss how NRCS and in partnership with other people like Cornell Cooperative Extension that's on the phone as well, um, uh, Ag and Markets uh, can help uh, in, in these processes with resources and education and training um, to help you be successful in, in growing food in smaller spaces. Um, so I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to put on at this time. So let me know when folks can see that. Someone verbally tell me if they can see the screen. Not yet. Um, you should be able to. Did you try clicking the share content button? Let me try that again. Okay, I'm going to get there. Yep, there we go. Great. So again, this presentation is on how to apply for a USDA uh, high tunnel. We call it a high tunnel system because there are various associated practices that can go along with installing a high tunnel. As you can see here, this structure, um, as Onika had discussed, is a larger structure um, than a low tunnel. Uh, it's something that can be used, like in this instance, on several acres, but also in smaller spaces um, as well. So working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, you can see at the top of my screen, there's an arrow that points to the NRCS. So again, that's the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and that's our website. At the end of the presentation, I have a slide with um, phone numbers and names as well. So if you're writing these things down and you missed the slide, it will come up again. This particular slide shows how NRCS would come and to your uh, farm or community garden and discuss the process of applying for a high tunnel. So the first thing we would do when we come is we always plan for the resources that are on your farm. So of course your objective may be for a high tunnel, but we may notice other things on your farm. It could be irrigation, it could be soil erosion. Um, there could be other things uh, related to pest control, uh, managing nutrients on the farm that we would discuss as well. Um, through that process, we have five steps here. So it's planning application. So you would apply for uh, funding or resources. The eligibility. So there are certain documents that you'll need to come together to work with us. Uh, everything is ranked competitively. So all the applications compete with other farms, community gardens, producers in your area. And then we would help with implementing and completing the project. So not just once the contracts are signed, if you are successful in getting a contract, uh, we walk with you and help um, through through implementing and completing your project. So in New York, uh, Liz Camps, and her information is here, and this slide again will be presented at the end, um, is a district conservationist that covers all the boroughs of New York City, including parts of Long Island or all of Long Island. And Oscar Velez, he's the district conservationist that covers the Hudson Valley, he's my supervisor. And together as a team, as I mentioned, we do work on this. And there's other people too. There's uh, engineers, there's biologists, uh, there's other soil conservationists that help as well to, to work on farms um, all throughout the region. I'm also going to give a shout out here to Harvest New York, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, Sam Anderson and Yolanda Gonzalez. Um, they are also been very helpful uh, along the way to many urban farmers and our specialists in this area, uh, as well as Kim Vallejo, who supports all the efforts um, in a very broad range to assist urban agricult agriculture in the city. And if there are any names that I, I didn't put here, um, I'm sure we can connect all those resources. And that picture is of some of us, you know who you are. So when NRCS comes to your farm, we would look to identify problems. Um, we'd work with you to determine what the objectives are on your farm for it to be successful uh, and addressing resource concerns. We'll talk about alternatives. There may be many suggestions that come across as ways to address a problem. And then the decisions would be made by um, the farmer, producer, grower on the site. 
So again, uh, overarching of what the NRCS can do, we can take a look at many things to help producers. So this first slide on the left, which shows soil that is um, having an erosion problem, you can see directly through the center of the slide where the water is carrying the soil away and uh, it's very uneven and in some ways um, unsuitable for growing in. Um, NRCS can help reduce that erosion, perhaps improve organic matter and make it healthy for growing. Nutrient management is something that is important in high tunnels. Uh, it is a controlled environment. The movement of water and nutrients in the soil is much different than outside. And um, it is important to uh, efficiently use nutrients and fertilizers. So that's something that NRCS can help with. And as well, Sam and Yolanda and the other folks that are on the call and Onika. Um, and as well, efficient moisture. So here you can see a farmer that's using a, um, an overhead a sprinkler system. And um, it, it's a great way to water, but it could be more efficient to conserve water, use less water and improve plant health. So into the, the topic of, of what everybody's excited about is, is using a high tunnel. Uh, the grower goals uh, for a high tunnel uh, people that we've spoken to in many different areas, whether it is in a in a very rural area or an urban uh, setting, um, um, is to extend the growing season, to increase access to fresh produce, especially um, in urban areas where there may not be local farms uh, or larger size uh, agricultural producers. Um, high tunnels can also help and control pest problems. Um, this the structure itself can keep pests out. Uh, some may say it could also be a place for us to come to and harbor, which is other problems that you may have to work to control. It could also minimize crop damage from excessive rain or sun. Uh, the thing I like, and it looks like it may have gotten cut off at the bottom, is they can make a great outdoor classroom. Uh, you know, kids, they can't wait to see and taste what's growing inside. So here's a great example of how NRCS evaluates a resource concern. So I mentioned erosion, I mentioned the issues with nutrients and also conserving water, but for this particular um, resource concern, it's how productive the plants are and how vigorous they're growing. So this is a field of peppers that were growing too late into the season. And when it got very cold, it broke down the uh, uh, vegetables and they were no longer saleable. So um, a high tunnel would have uh, minimized those issues and those uh, crops would have been able to grow uh, for an extended period of time inside the structure, the high tunnel. So the soil's warmer, the air temperature's warmer, and that's what will help make those high, those uh, plants um, have vigor. So one thing I do want to mention in the process of what a high tunnel is and how uh, you can apply for it is that part of our, our rules are that, our policies is that you must be growing in the soil itself, so in, in the ground or in raised beds, so it cannot be in containers or pots or on raised benches, which you would see like in a greenhouse. So again, just a great slide that shows on the left, that's Carl. He's outside uh, using this overhead. And on the we're, we're hoping to get Carl into uh, drip irrigation soon, but on the right-hand slide side, that is showing a drip irrigation system where there's a um, tube that's running along the plants in the soil and it emits water uh, efficiently to the, to the very needs of each plant. So um, NRCS has engineers that could work with you to design a system to efficiently grow uh, crops um, so that their um, yields are to what you're looking for. And that practice is called micro irrigation. Again, when we're planning uh, in urban areas, uh, unfortunately, these soils may have uh, contained pollutants, uh, including heavy metals or trace metals. NRCS works with a bunch of partners. This happens uh, here to be the Urban Soils Institute. That's with the Soil and Water Conservation District in New York City. And they're using a handheld device, uh, an X-ray inflorescence, XRF, that can identify these trace metals on the spot or those samples can be sent in as well. But it's always good to have them come out and take a look at the site. This is what's uh, called a conservation plan. So once 
our conservationist has taken a look at your site and discussed various alternatives. This is what a plan would look like. A plan is ongoing, it's not a contract, it's not binding, it's just the things that you talked about and were potential uh, um, opportunities to improve the environment on your, your farm. So on the right is uh, a picture of a typical farm and what is um, the call out box there or the description in the middle of the picture is of a high tunnel and then critical area planting, which is a strip of grass on either side of the high tunnel. And that's a requirement. So three feet on either side of the high tunnel in a permanent grass uh, is required and establishing it, there's mulch that's just put on those seedlings. So those three things do make up a system. Um, so that is um, something that um, is part of the conservation planning process. So I'm not going to spend much time here. Uh, this will be covered in more detail uh, as we move forward uh, into the uh, planning and uh, application process with USDA. But I did want to put up a slide so that we could discuss some of these items. And as you prepare, uh, it'll be easier to move forward uh, working with us, uh, especially on the, the many forms and papers that we have. So as you um, we're, we're told a little bit earlier, USDA has many programs that we offer. Uh, this one happens to be Agricultural Management Assistance, or AMA. It's a program that you can apply and receive uh, funding for a seasonal high tunnel. There's also another program that's called the Environmental Qualities Incentive Program, EQIP. So again, I'm giving all these acronyms. You can apply for a high tunnel under that program as well. It just doesn't happen to be the, the season when that, that program is available. But it, that opportunity will come up for 2021 um, within the next few months. So this agricultural management assistance, you can apply uh, in, in, in a few ways. And there are things on the form that um, your district conservationist will help you complete. You can apply as an individual, which would require a social security number or an entity. Um, and then there's a specific number that I believe you get from the state and the federal government um, as an employee identification number. Um, some of these things uh, may vary. And when you work with the USDA staff, they'll help you identify whether you're an individual or an entity. Because some people may have a business um, as well, and they can help you determine uh, the best way to apply. Within the application, there are... Um, Selections for historically underserved, beginning farmer, limited resource producer, socially disadvantaged, veterans, preference veterans, um, and then organic certified and transitioning. These slides and going through this could take an hour itself. So we're going to hold off on that. The other agency that you'll have to uh, work with, uh, they would require a map of the location or property, the section lot and block number if you have it, um, and then they'll assign what's called the farm and track number. So that's exciting. We'd love to see if we could increase the number of farms and farm track numbers in New York City. So once you've gone through the process of an application and it's rolling through the system and you're working with your conservationist, the application will be ranked. And again, it's ranked in competition with other uh, urban farms in, in the area. Um, it assigns points and higher point values for environmental benefit. So your conservationist may work with you to do a pollinator planting. You can see this pollinator planting next to that seasonal high tunnel um, here. So this seasonal high tunnel happens to be in Cleveland. Cleveland, this was pointed out to me, Cleveland may have some different standards in the way that they operate their, their uh, um, program. So they don't have the three feet of grass there, but I just thought it was a very good example of how a pollinator planting and a seasonal high tunnel go together. And there are an increased environmental benefit um, as well as great for, for increasing yields on your farm. So the land use and location would be discussed. So earlier, as Anika mentioned, we'd wanna help you cite it where there's the most benefit from sun, um, where there's the structures and tall buildings, that's a concern and each site would be on an individual basis to get that proper solar array. Um, things you would consider is slope, 
So there are certain specs that we would want to ensure it's on the right slope of the land so that it's structurally sound. Um, and with that, each municipality or um, city may have rules and regulations with um, permits. So always check with local government to ensure that it's being installed um, to meet everybody's standards. The other thing too is making sure, you know, what is the proximity to market? Are you growing your food within a certain distance to um, um, consumers that um, would really benefit uh, you even as a, as a producer, if it's to earn money or um, to help sustain um, healthy eating uh, and uh, uh, access to local foods. So here's another part of the contracting process. And unfortunately, this is not the fun side of things, but um, once you've completed a uh, contract with, or as you're approaching to complete a contract with NRCS, all of the practices would be reviewed. You would have it, it at, up until the point of signing a contract, nothing would be binding. And it's a great time to just review all the practices that you um, were thinking about having into a plan and what would be feasible um, over the course of a few years. So a lot of times it's, it's, it's exciting to get the funding to do things with NRCS, but it's important to make sure that um, as you're contracting, you're giving yourself enough of a schedule and a timeline to complete those practices. So um, working with NRCS, um, there's always staff to assist in all those things and open communication with your district conservationist is always uh, the, the best path to seeing these projects completed successfully. So once the contracts are completed and signed, uh, there are a couple of ways that um, payments could be made. Um, in this, we're hoping that the people who sell these high tunnel systems would agree to do what's called an authorization of a signed payment. So basically what this is saying is that the contract holder would have a certain amount of money that they could assign directly to be paid to the seller of the high tunnel system. So whatever the contract deal was that the purchaser being the producer has with the manufacturer or the seller of the high tunnel, once it's completed, those payments will go directly to them. A lot of times the um, manufacturer or seller does appreciate that because it guarantees them the payment. What we would hope to have been able to offer, but it's not in this AMA program. I, I mentioned there is the AMA program, which is available now for high tunnels, but the EQIP program is not. Under that program, there's a really great um, advanced payment opportunity for historically underserved participants, where you can receive 50% of the cost of the total practice upfront. But unfortunately, that's just not available. So, so those that can see the slides, there's a line that's going through all of that. So. Um, just again, the authorization of a signed payment is, is uh, something that we're hoping will be available. Um, it's a lot to take in, so when these slides come to you, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, to give me a call. So there's something that's called the Conservation Client Gateway, and it's an online way that participants of our programs can take a look at all the documents that you've signed with NRCS, um, access any maps of your farm that were created by your conservationist, and also to request services. So this is something that is mildly used by participants, but I think it's a good way that in the future now we can have more um, more interactions and, and availability of our resources uh, to the public. I'm sure in the future they're going to get to having this as um, something that's more interactive with farmers to be able to sign documents and and things of that in the nature in, in the, but don't hold me to that. I'm just thinking that as technology is moving forward, some of the paperwork would probably be minimized. And this is the way that, that our resources would be available as well. So again, on implementation, um, there are some, some standards and specs that have to be followed. All seasonal high tunnels are purchased as kits. So if you wanted to bend the pipes and make them yourself, Fortunately, that's not something that we would be able to fund. So you would, um, working with your, your conservationist, come up with a high tunnel. We request that you just send your quote and your specs directly to them before you make a purchase. And in, in New York, it's important to note that it has what's called uh, snow load 
uh, capacity. So what looks like a skeleton that runs down the top of this high tunnel is required in New York to ensure that snow doesn't um, overtake the high tunnel, heavy snow loads and crush it down. What's important to note as well is even with this structure, you would have to maintain the snow. So after a heavy snow, it's important to get out and shake it off. And if it's building up on the sides, it's important to keep that snow away because after the first snow, you may have two feet out there, you know, and then before you know it, there's a big mound of snow and it's hard to, to brush it off the sides of the high tunnel. So continued maintenance during the winter uh, is something that we, we consider. So here's another picture of the um, grass strip that is being established alongside of this high tunnel. And it's something that um, is paid for in the cost list. Here are a few things that people ask if we pay for or not. Unfortunately, we don't pay for shade cloth over the top of uh, plastic. Um, you are allowed to install roll up sides. That usually is an additional cost when making a purchase on a high tunnel. You can do raised beds. There's a maximum of 12 inch height that's allowable within inside the high tunnel. Again, you can't grow up on benches. That's not something suitable. And you cannot grow in containers. That would be considered uh, something that we wouldn't, wouldn't permit. So that's, that's basically the end of the high tunnel presentation. But what I did want to mention, I have a few more slides if there's more time, if I could get a thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. So the Farm Service Agency is another agency that is aligned with USDA and RCS. And I just wanted to have a slide here that gave an overview of some of their programs. We're going to have uh, someone from the Farm Service Agency uh, present some information in the future when they talk about the application process. But just so farmers know, they could also um, provide different types of loans. One of them would be the micro loans. And we've seen uh, interesting things where people have done um, urban farming inside of containers um, and so forth. So there are opportunities in urban areas, um, farm storage facility loans, uh, uh, cold storage is something that's available. And then they do a lot on insurances, which I won't comment on because that's not my area of expertise, but something that could be of value to some. And then the last thing is that it's important to know that this farm service agency as a government body, they do have what's called the county committee. And it's a way that the that farmers that are in, in, in our USDA system can participate and have a say in how programs are carried out with this government agency. So uh, overall, I mentioned the newly forming Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. Um, we're going to see an increase in, in support for urban agriculture over the next couple of months. There will be grants that will come out through grants.gov, several other agencies, like including the Forest Service, because they have some, uh, some urban tree programs for growing fruit, as well as uh, NIFA, which is um, food and agriculture. So I would take a look at those as they come out. There is a urban agriculture toolkit that's available online. If you use a, a search network, you'll find it. There's funding opportunities within that, opportunities for technical assistance, as well as other resources in there, whether it's nutrition, education, and farm to school. So this is a really great resource. Some of the things are out, a little outdated uh, in terms of links, but overall, um, we're working to update that at this time. So here is the list of uh, contacts if you're interested in, in a high tunnel, um, Oscar or Liz, and if you need other assistance as well, Sam and Yolanda are listed here, um, and Kim. That's, that's it. I, the last slide is the non-discrimination statement. So I'll put, I can put that up uh, as well. Thank you, Joe and Onika. That was great. That was a lot of information and we really appreciate everything you're sharing today. Um, we will send a follow-up email to everyone who's on the call and also who RSVP'd um, with 
copies of the slides if you guys are okay with that and links to everything that you're sharing. We do have some questions in the chat box and thank you Onika for answering them. I will, I'm going to read them out loud just so we get them in the recording and then you can answer them again out loud. Um, so first question is, are there any concerns about the use of plastic because it's not environmentally friendly? Are there alternatives to plastic or ways to make it more sustainable? Yeah, so thank, thank you so much M for mentioning that. Um, and my answer was, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about it, Joe, too, um, that it really depends on what you're, what, what you're trying to achieve with the system that you're putting in, right? So if you're primarily, especially if you're using a low tunnel, you have a lot more options because it's just less area to cover. Um, and if you're primarily looking to keep your plants warm or to warm up the, warm up the soil, then you can accomplish that with some fabrics um, pretty well. Um, you just might need to uncover them in order to let some sun in. So the 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 trade-off is if you're using something clear like plastic or glass, you'll have optimal sun and optimal heat. Um, but if you um, want to go a more organic route and you want to sac sacrifice the least amount in terms of light, um, the best thing I can think of is maybe using a white sheet or some kind of white fabric that at least allows some of the passive solar in, um, but it will not do as much as it would if there was plastic or glass being used. What do you think, Joe? I would have to, con to concur with that. Um, I, I know that there is technology at the universities that they're looking at with alternative materials. So let's let's keep our thumbs up that those are going to happen um, relatively soon. That's great. Yeah, I, even things like Rime, um, you know, are um, not an organic material. They're still made of plastics, even though they're more flexible like fabric. So um, there's not a, a lot of options, unfortunately, yet. Thank you, both of you. Um, the second question is, is it covered in this session to use an old window to make a cold frame? Also, can one use a roof to make a hoop system? And I am grateful for Sam Anderson for posting a link to your webinar um, on cold frames that you did with Yolanda and Olivia Gamber. Um, and that and Sam is with the Cornell Cooperative Extension. So I'm I'm hoping that that will be available on the Cornell Cooperative Extension website for folks who are listening. Yes, I know that that I wanted to attend that one live and I know Joe was able to be a part of that webinar as well um, through the craft New York kind of network. Um, and yes, uh, I think it's a, a great idea. I always love recycling things. So it's a great idea to be able to use a, an old window. Um, I did a workshop on that a couple of years ago um, and I still have the cold frame that we created from that. The only, only thing I would caution you about, because this is actually what happened to me just this year, is if you're, um, what I did was I used, um, I put two edges of poly on either side of the glass window. Um, my hope was that it would protect things from dropping down and breaking the glass, which is what I want to avoid doing. But that actually happened anyway, unfortunately for me. So um, it took many years, but something, um, something blew into it and actually broke the glass, so there ended up being glass in my raised bed, which is obviously not ideal. So um, that and lead paint are the two things I would just caution you about if you're going to be using um, a recycled material like a window frame. Um, if there is paint on it, you want to just do a, a quick check. You can buy them at Home Depot for lead in the paint um, and make sure you don't use it if it's a lead paint because that paint will flake off, um, it will be weathered outside, it will get into your soil and it will defeat the purpose of um, providing a healthy, you know, soil for your plants and yourself. Um, and Sam is going to work it out on the chat in terms of making sure that we have access to that, um, that webinar. And yeah, Joe, do you have experience with that window idea? The second part, I thought I heard a question on rooftops. Was that as well? There was a question on putting a, putting structures on roofs. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Um, the question is, can one use a roof to make a hoop system? So, uh, I, I, it, what we're hoping, because we, this is all starting new territory for NRCS, is that we will be able to do hoop houses, high tunnels on roofs. So we have to evaluate that with engineers and each 
site. I believe Brooklyn Grange has one, and um, we're hoping to get over there with our engineers and ask them what their success was because you know there's a lot of wind on top of roofs and certainly um, you know making sure that it was it was um, structurally safe. So that's something we're excited about doing. If anyone's uh, currently has a, a hoop house or a high tunnel or even a low tunnel on a roof, we'd love to hear about it and see what your success was or or challenges. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I am going to unmute our friends who are on the phone. So if you are on the phone, I am unmuting you and you can ask a question if you would like to. Um, hi, this is Aura. I'm sorry. I had a previous meeting, so kind of came into this meeting. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having us. My question is, um, so what type of grant that we will have to apply for to cover the cost of certain things that we have to do as far as the tunnel? So this is Joe Heller. And if, uh, if the application is approved for a high tunnel or, or other things on the farm, like maybe even irrigation inside the high tunnel, there's what's called a cost list, and the cost list is created to include not only the cost of the materials, but it includes labor as well. So in some cases, if you're able to uh, do, the, like say, install a high tunnel yourself, then those resources would be available for perhaps other things. So uh, we encourage folks to be able to, to um, cost out their projects and we'll help with that ahead of time to, to know just how much of our of the funding that's coming from USDA is going to really be available for you to establish your 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 high tunnel because we want it to be feasible. In most cases what I've seen is that a basic high tunnel can be installed by a contractor with the funds that we've provided. Uh, sometimes it may cost a little bit more depending on the cost of of labor in in your area so if that does that answer your question yeah so do it have to come off a building or can it just be inside um inside of the garden area itself so inside of the garden is is where uh we're we're very familiar the garden of happiness in the bronx uh karen washington she has a high tunnel and liz if you're on the phone you could Maybe perhaps um, you know we we could discuss some other publicly known sites. Um, you can see how she installed that high tunnel at that that Grow NYC site, I believe, um, um, in an outdoor urban location. So when I think of an urban location like what you're talking about, it's more of a smaller space. So that high tunnel happens to be 500 square feet. Um, which fit really well yeah, in so the we site. Have, so, sorry, my site is, my garden is the Seth Garden, where we're the largest um, one in East New York. Oh, wow. And um, so we have the space for it, but the only thing about it is because we're so big, it's only one building there. So how will we be able to do that in the garden setting? And like with the building that's next to it, we we have to get permission and all of this stuff from the landlord and things like that. So how do you do it without using the building? I guess what we would have to do is, and I'd have to talk maybe with the other folks on the phone and meet with you on the site. You know, we can have our district conservationist come out. And those are the types of things that we're familiar with in helping come up with a plan to, um, it, to work through those barriers to getting the high tunnel up. And again, for USDA and RCS, we do have a few high tunnels in New York City. And some of the issues like you mentioned on working with uh, permits and those types of, of, of responsibilities, we could certainly help guide, guide that and um, make sure that we get it through. However, a lot of those things are, um, 
are the responsibility of the landowner or, you know, the, the farmer. So we can only go so far to ensure that, you know, permits and those things are acquired. You know, we're, we're there on the technical side to help uh, with the high tunnel um, it, it itself. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple more questions in the chat that I just want to make sure we get to since we have just five minutes left. Um, the first one is, um, how do you keep a garden cloche warm in the winter? Is that your question, Flo? Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the, the beauties of the structure is that um, a, a well-designed garden cloche will allow air to um, both allow light in, which makes this kind of like warm, passive solar um, situation happen, um, and also allow air to escape as it's getting too hot and make it make sure it doesn't bake your plant. Um, so that will even happen with something like, uh, you know, some of the other, some of the ones that we saw that were made out of plastic bottles. That process can happen. Um, I think that some of the things that you can do to make that even um, warmer is to um, maybe cap the, if you're using a plastic bottle, maybe cap that towards the um, end of the day. Um, you might also consider like, you know, um, covering it uh, with some additional insulation to make it a little bit warmer. Um, but as long as you, and I also would say it would be really helpful to try to put that in as, this, as sunny a place as possible, because that will allow for that solar, you know, that passive solar to, to warm it up. Thank you, Onika. Um, the next question is, what were the three parts that make up the high tunnel system? That might be a question for Joe, yeah. Yes, the high tunnel system is the high tunnel itself, the structure. And then there were the two additional practices, the seating to establish the three feet of grass on either side and the mulch that goes on top. The mulch is to help those seatings get established alongside of the high tunnel. So those are the three required things of the system. But the system could be larger, it could be irrigation, it could be nutrient management and soil health. And then why is the three feet of grass required on the side? When it rains, water uh, erodes, water rushes off the side of the high tunnel to the, to the outside and it causes erosion. So to re reduce and minimize that, uh, that's why that three feet of grass is included. Why is growing in the soil required? Why are containers, benches, and beds over 12 inches prohibited? So the of the seasonal high tunnel is to um, minimize, I'm just going to go back, I still have my slides, it, it minimizes it, it, the effects of plant productivity and you have to grow the high, you have to install a high tunnel where crops were already being grown and uh, in the soil the crops um, there were in, the, in, in cold climate cases of the use of a high tunnel, they're not able to live in a colder temperature. So by putting the high tunnel enclosure over that field where those crops were growing, you're now extending the season of the high tunnel, of those crops because of the high tunnel in that specific area. The reason that we don't do uh, pots and or raised benches is that that's what, we, what sort of delineates what a greenhouse structure would be. Thank you. Um, so to close us out, we have some questions about eligibility. I remember, Onika, you shared with me that you're doing a follow up for Q&A specifically about the grant. Do you want to say anything about that? Yes. Well, um, Joe and also um, Liz and Oscar, who are on the call as well from USDA, had talked about wanting to, for people who are really thinking about applying for this grant, um, the deadline is coming up soon. Um, that we would do a special webinar uh, to really do Q and A around that next week. So we actually have an we talked about doing it on Wednesday. We we haven't agreed on a date. So unless we want to do that right now, Joe, maybe we should follow up with an email to folks, um, and we can definitely um, share that through Green Thumb. Um, but it is a very you know it's it's a it's a involved process, and we want to make sure people are their questions are answered. 
Thank you. All right, so we'll send a follow up email. We really appreciate Onika and Joe. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing all of your knowledge with us. That was incredible. Um, and everyone who joined us on the call on the webinar, thank you for taking your time and spending it. Um, growing food. We really, really appreciate you. I'm going to invite everyone if you want to to go into gallery view and turn on your cameras and wave hello because we're all you know in social distancing social isolation so come on into gallery view and we and turn on your cameras and say hi and i will you can unmute yourself too if you want to <laughs> so thank you so much joe thank you so much onika thank you all hope to see you outside again soon Look at all these beautiful Bye. faces. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Right, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Bye. 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 Nice cat. Bye.